Well, welcome to another Friday night. We've been doing a series that's taking a deeper look at the 60 characteristics of complex trauma. And today we come to the instant gratification focus. And I want to develop and explain why it's such an issue with complex trauma and then show how it can really mess up people's recovery and really be a hindrance to them in doing recovery well. So as always, let's begin with a definition of instant gratification. And and there's two ways of looking at it. So the first is instant gratification is a habit where you forego short-term pain, indulge in a fleeting pleasure that ultimately results in long-term pain. So you give up short-term pain to have pleasure, but end up with long-term pain. Other one is, it's a form of self-sabotage where you get caught up in indulging in the temptations of life at the cost of long-term goals. So you get so preoccupied with getting short-term pleasure that you end up missing long-term goals. Or another way to say it just from a neurological standpoint Instant gratification focus is living with limbic pleasure, limbic brain pleasure as your main focus. And that is what ties us in to the complex trauma piece. But let me, let me begin by saying this, that the limbic brain, as we point out time and time again, is all about the child brain. It's the part of the brain that develops during childhood. And so what characterizes a child's brain is that they don't think in terms of long-term consequences. They think in terms of what will give me pleasure now. And they don't think beyond that. And so a wise decision is considered one that makes me feel good instant gratification. That's the focus of a child, and it's why they need parents who are living out of their cortex who can think through the long-term consequences as they guide a child in their development. So now let's bring in complex trauma. So what happens in complex trauma is it takes the child brain piece a little bit further. The child brain is instant gratification focus, But what happens in complex trauma is you're in constant danger, constant fear, and fear triggers the limbic brain. And so now the focus becomes not just instant gratification, but instant protection. I need safety now. I don't need to think through long-term consequences. I just have to find safety now. So again, it has an instant focus time-wise. And then what comes out of the complex trauma is that you stay in your limbic brain because you're still in danger. So a child's development is, yes, they're in their limbic brain, but as they're in their limbic brain with wise parents, their cortex is developing. And its role is to eventually become the manager of the brain, the executive function part of the brain where it listens to the limbic brain and gets input from the limbic brain, but then processes everything in terms of long-term consequences and hopefully makes wise decisions. But when you're in complex trauma, your cortex doesn't develop because you're always in your limbic brain. And so when you reach your adult years, instead of a wise cortex, you still have a limbic brain running the show as the boss, as the main part of what is involved in making decisions, and the focus is still instant pleasure or instant protection. So complex trauma prevents the normal development of the brain from a child brain to a wise brain, and it keeps people in the child brain. But then beyond that, when you look at complex trauma, the majority of the emotions are negative. Pain, hurt, fear, embarrassment, shame, loss. 
A child tries to resolve them and fix them, but he can't. And so he's left with, I can't get rid of these negative emotions. And they just keep snowballing into more and more negative emotions. And so what comes out of that is, I need to grab any pleasure I can get whenever I have an opportunity. And so you get an instant gratification focus that comes out of that. But more than that, in complex trauma, many children grow up with parents promising wonderful things. We're going to go on a vacation this year to Disneyland. We're going to go um, out for ice cream after supper tonight. We're going to do all these things. And the kid is looking forward to these wonderful pleasures. And then the parents don't follow through on the promise. And they break the promise, and the child never gets the pleasure. And so after a while, they realize that whenever a promise is made where it requires a delay, where you have to wait to get the result of the promise, there's a good chance you're never going to get it. So grab the opportunity for pleasure when you have it. Don't trust the promises of other people. So that comes out of complex trauma. Then what happens in complex trauma is many of a child's needs are not met. They aren't accepted. They aren't nurtured. They aren't understood. They can't connect. All of these relational, emotional needs go unmet. And so what happens is they have these growing desires for validation. They have growing desires for those needs to be met. But they can't define those needs. They're too young. They don't understand all of their needs. And so what happens when something comes along like a new video game? And all their friends are getting it. And their friends are talking about it. And they think, that's going to make me happy. They don't see that meeting of needs will make them happy. All they see is the meeting of this need of getting that video game That for sure will make me happy. It's a fantasy, but to them it's the truth. And so what you find is when you live with a whole bunch of unmet needs that you don't understand, and an opportunity comes along that looks like it will make you totally happy, your desire for instant gratification intensifies. I need that. I must have that. I want it now. And that comes out of complex trauma. Then out of complex trauma for many people who've lived with unmet needs, neglect, abuse, they can develop a sense of entitlement that says, I owe it to myself to have all my needs met now as an adult. I am entitled to pleasure after all the crap I've been through. So I need to live for my own pleasure. And that can come out of complex trauma. Now, having said all of that, take complex trauma that takes place in the Western culture. And what you find is our Western culture just amplifies this problem around instant gratification and makes it even harder for people with complex trauma to face it and change it. So what is happening in our Western culture that kind of factors into this whole problem of instant gratification focus is number one, we've become an instant gratification society. We are a society that lives for limbic brain gratifications. People don't want to think of long-term consequences. They want to live for pleasure now. And so our whole culture is oriented that instant gratification is the right way to live. But then on top of that, we live in a culture where it is very easy to get a credit card. It is very easy to get a loan. And then on top of that, you, have, you can now go shopping on the internet because of technology. And so now you can just see something, say, oh, I want that. Go to your computer on the internet and, and, 
have a credit card and doesn't matter about debt. You don't think of the consequences about that. It's just, wow, an opportunity to get what I want with very little resistance or very few obstacles to overcome. So our society has made that. And then what happens when a society becomes more affluent is you have extra cash. After paying the necessities, the bills for the necessities, you have extra cash on hand. Well, that's burning a hole in your pocket. Let's spend it. So let's just get something we don't really need, but that will give us pleasure. So an affluent culture begins to struggle with instant gratification, and then it becomes, oh, my friend just got this. Well, I got extra cash. I'll get this too. He looks happy. I think this will make me happy. And then if you look at our culture, the more technology we have, much of our technology was originally geared to make things faster and easier. So instead of going to a well and drawing water by hand, we now turn a tap and have instant water. Now we don't even have to wait to cook a meal in an oven or over a fire. We have a microwave. We can get everything faster. We have faster computers that allow us to do all kinds of things faster. So technology has kind of steered us in the direction of getting things faster and faster, and that feeds into instant gratification. So our culture does not make it easy to see this issue accurately as a problem or to confront it and deal with it. So I think we need to talk about then, what are some of the problems of instant gratification? Because a lot of people will say, what's wrong with instant gratification? You, lit, you grab all you can today. Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. That's the mindset. Number one, instant gratification does not necessarily result in long-term health. A child that is allowed to eat candy and chocolate bars just because it gives them instant gratification, down the road, that, they're going to pay for that. There will be consequences. So you can try to minimize instant gratification focus when it's all about indulging your desires, but the long-term consequences will come. You cannot prevent that. That is built into how we work. Secondly, have you ever thought of how long instant gratification, the pleasure that comes from it, how long does it last? So let me ask you this. How long does the pleasure of eating a potato chip last? Not very long. How long does the pleasure even of an orgasm last? Not very long. And so what happens when you have an instant gratification focus is you end up chasing fleeting pleasures. And that becomes your pursuit. And that leads to the next problem. Whenever we are taking a healthy need that is a pleasurable, so eating food, having sex, those are built into us that they all have their purpose, but whenever we overindulge that, beyond its original design, it begins to operate by the law of diminishing returns. It begins to give less and less pleasure until it becomes boring. And that's because whenever we have a pleasure more than kind of what was designed, our brain goes, oh, that's too much. I need to adjust. I need to develop a tolerance for this so the brain changes a little bit so that that pleasure now just feels like it used to feel. And so what then happens is whenever you live for instant gratification, it will begin to operate by the law of diminishing returns, which means you always will need a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more to try and get the same pleasure. But eventually, it will operate like addiction. It will become empty and boring. So instant gratification 
If you pursue that, it has a self-defeating mechanism within it so that eventually it no longer satisfies. Then, I think it's important to realize that continued, persistent indulgence of instant gratification does not lead to satisfaction, it leads to dissatisfaction. It leads to the opposite of what you are wanting. And that is a painful reality for most. Paul Roberts, who has an internet a page on the web says this, the notion of future consequences, long-term consequences, is so essential to our development as functional citizens or adults. In other words, what enables a society to be healthy and people to get along is they think in terms of long-term consequences of actions. And so it is when you live for instant gratification, that future consequences idea is relegated to the background, inviting us to remain in a state of permanent childhood. In other words, your culture goes from mature, wise adults to a culture of immature children who are just living for pleasure. And that is the dissolution of a culture. It begins to break down more conflict, more war, all kinds of different things that are negative begin to happen, crime, as people live just for instant gratification. So I hope you see that the long-term consequences of instant gratification focus are disastrous. They take people, they take cultures, they take families to a more unhealthy place with more problems, more emptiness, more pain. The exact opposite of what people want. Now let me bring it to recovery. How does this instant gratification focus, if you don't change it, how does it mess up recovery? So let me give you three things where it can mess up. So number one, it can develop this desire for a magic fix. So we call it magical thinking. So you come in recovery with an instant gratification focus and you're looking for an instant cure. You're looking to get over your problems immediately. So you want to find a program, a remedy that will just fix you. The problem with dealing with trauma is there's not an instant fix. And so what happens for many people is they just chase one magical solution after another for years and never find it. And they start their recovery years after they could have if they had started with the realization there's not an instant fix. It's going to take time and hard work. Let me give you another piece to this where the instant gratification is affected by our culture. Our culture puts a lot of emphasis, and rightly so, on education. But much of what our education system is, is basically the acquiring of academic knowledge, information. And so we think when a person has the right information, then we can graduate them, and then they're ready. But there's a flaw in that. So just think of it this way. I get clients all the time that come to me on their first week of going through React or Lyft, and they go, we just want you to tell us the tools. So think of an eight-year-old child coming to you and saying, I want to be the president of General Motors. Next week, teach me the tools. And you go, well, there's more than just learning information to be able to do that job. There are years of building character qualities. There are years of learning about people and life in general. You don't just learn academic tools and then you're ready for a job. But a lot of people coming into recovery think, just teach me some tools and then I'll, I'll be fixed. And I go, no, it's way more than that. 
You need to learn some academic information, yes. But you got to retrain. you got to build character. you got to get healthy ways of coping. And you just don't get that from learning some tools. It takes years of practice. Then I think there's an issue that our culture feeds into this instant gratification as well, which is our current medical model. Another way to say our current medical model is what we would call a linear progression. So you're sick, so you go to the doctor, he diagnoses you, step one. Then he prescribes a treatment for you, which is either medication, surgery, or a therapy, or a combination of those three. And then you see instant improvement. You see instant change. And so our thinking is if I have a problem, follow the medical model. There should be a diagnosis, prescribe a solution, an instant fix. So that within a period of a few weeks or months, I should be over this. Now the problem with that is the medical model does not work on trauma. And I want you to understand that. Healing from trauma is not a linear process. It doesn't have a start and end date with three easy steps. Healing from trauma has three stages, but they're not linear. So stage one is safety. So a person cannot heal from trauma unless they feel safe, unless they're in a safe environment with safe people. And so the goal of a therapist, a counselor, facilitator, is to provide a safe environment so people can begin to heal. And that leads to the second part, which is now when they're safe, they can reprocess their trauma. They can go back and reprocess it now as an adult with new tools and new supports and learn from it and heal. But what happens when a person goes to the memories of that trauma is it triggers feelings of lack of safety. And so you got to go back to step A. And that you might then, they have to stay there for a few days or weeks before they're ready to go back to step B. And then you go back to another memory, it triggers lack of safety, so you go back to step A. So it's back and forth, back and forth. And then eventually you want them to get to step C, which is moving on with life. We've dealt enough with the trauma that you're not going to be triggered every minute. You're going to be able to regulate your emotions better. You're more aware of your patterns and your triggers. Great stuff has been happening. So let's move on with life. But then what happens as you move on with life? You still get triggered. Not as often, but you will get triggered. And so all of a sudden, you've got to go back to step A. And then you reprocess step B. And so it's not a linear thing. So that's the first thing I want you to see is that complex trauma does not follow the medical model. It is not a linear healing progression. It is a lengthy, messy, slow back and forth process. But there's a second thing that I want you to understand. A little while ago, I was listening to Dr. Bruce Lipton, who's a neuroscientist. And he gave us some research that I just found fascinating. And I want to say up front that as I go through this research, some of you are going to find it discouraging. And I'm not telling you this to discourage you, but to just give you the reality of what we're dealing with with our brains in healing our brains and changing our brains after trauma has taken place. So Bruce Lipton comes at it from the context or from the perspective of two parts of the brain being the subconscious part of your brain and the conscious part. So the subconscious is the part you're not, the brain's doing stuff and you're not even aware of it. Or you know the brain's doing stuff, but you're not consciously thinking about what the brain's doing. It's just doing it under the radar of your conscious mind at that moment. So here's what the research has shown, and to me it's fascinating. 
our subconscious brain, first of all, processes 40 million bits of data a second. That, to me, is mind-boggling. So it's processing data basically in two areas. So the first area is it's monitoring the many systems of our body. So just think of this fact. Your eye, when you're just seeing, your eye is sending 10 million bits of data a second to your brain. And it's your subconscious brain that is monitoring those 10 million bits of data just from your eye. But then you have internal systems and external systems around you, plus other things going on. So just think of your eye, 10 million bits, but then you're smelling stuff, you're hearing stuff constantly, you taste stuff. It's monitoring all of those messages coming in. Then you get cold or you're hot. It's monitoring that. You get a scratch or you feel an itch and you feel the need to itch or you get a cut or a blister. So all these external systems it is monitoring or even if you get a bug or a mosquito on your arm, there's things that are sending information to your brain to monitor every hair on your body that is being changed. So that's just a small part of that. Then think of the internal systems that you have. You're thirsty. You're hungry. Your brain detects that. You're nauseous. Your brain detects that. You climb up a set of stairs. Your brain knows that you're short of oxygen in your muscles and it begins to send out messages to increase your breathing, to increase your heart rate so that you get the oxygen to your muscles. You get the urge, I got to go to the bathroom. Your body's detecting the state of your bladder and your bowels. You get a bacteria or a virus in your, your brain is monitoring all of those systems. So many systems, all your internal organs, 40 million bits of data a second. You can spend time thinking about this. Just the amount of work your brain has to do to keep you balanced, standing on your feet to enable you to walk, to digest your food, it's just mind-boggling. That's your subconscious brain. Then you have the second part of what your subconscious brain does. And this is where I'm going to start to really focus on the complex trauma piece and this part I really want you to get. So it's doing all of that other stuff, but it's also keeping track of everything that happens in your life. It's writing a history and trying to make sense of that history. So let me give you some examples. Let's say that you were sexually abused, but your brain picked up that the person who sexually abused you always smelled of old spice. So your brain logs that in its diary, and now it associates the smell of old spice with sexual abuse. It makes a connection in your, because of your history, okay? Let's say that every time you cried as a child, you were punished. And so your subconscious brain is saying crying equals punishment equals more pain. Or let's say every time dad got drunk, he became violent and hurt mom or one of the kids. And so dad coming home drunk now, your, your subconscious brain makes a connection. Dad is drunk, something bad's going to happen, go and hide. So your subconscious brain is looking through every aspect of your daily life and your history, and it's trying to make sense out of it. It's trying to create patterns. It's trying to create, connect the dots for you so that you understand your world better. But here's what I want you to understand, and that is your subconscious brain can only play back what it has learned. 
It only is looking back at kind of what is happening today in light of your history. It doesn't think of the future. It's just preoccupied with history, and it's a habitual thing. It's preoccupied with patterns and drawing conclusions from patterns. Okay, so having understood that, what you then understand is your subconscious brain is not able to generate change. It's just keeping track. It's just a record of what has happened in your life. Okay, so let's move on to our conscious brain. So our subconscious brain, it processes 40 million bits of data a second. Our conscious brain processes only 40 bits of data a second. A million times slower. So important to understand. But more than that, our conscious brain is the only part of our brain that's able to be creative and look for solutions. Our subconscious brain looks for patterns but doesn't look for how it can change it. Our conscious brain looks for how it can change it. It's the creative part of us that can bring about change, that brings about the free will choice stuff. The next problem that we have is our conscious brain is operating only 1% to 5% of the day. It's in charge. That means 95 to 99% of our behavior is controlled by our subconscious brain. We respond in ways of the old patterns. We respond because what our subconscious brain has done is created an autopilot for us, a a programmed system, and we just do that. And so you can relate to that. You can be deep in thought about something in your conscious brain, but you can be getting stuff out of the fridge, you can be washing dishes, you can be making a meal, and then afterwards you go, did I do that? Did I do that? I don't remember doing that. Because your subconscious was in autopilot because your conscious brain was focusing on a problem. So your subconscious brain is running the show 95 to 99% of the time. Your conscious brain, very little. So here is the problem of complex trauma. It trains your subconscious brain with a faulty program. It looks for patterns. It says that an angry person will always be violent, so run. That's not necessarily true. But it creates a system, programs, an autopilot of thousands of maladaptive systems, not maladaptive responses. That person looks like my dad, so don't trust them. Thousands and thousands, and you're not even aware of them. You just operate that way. So people always say to me, why am I attracted to narcissists? That's your subconscious programming, because that feels normal. You know what to do with that. Why do I go to the worst case scenario? That's part of your subconscious autopilot. All of those things, 95 to 99% of how we operate is done on that subconscious autopilot. And complex trauma causes that to be a faulty system, to be a system that leads to more pain, more damage, more harm. So how do we change the subconscious programming to get a healthy autopilot? That is the question. And so here's what we have to do. We have to become aware of what the subconscious program is in a certain area, bring it to our conscious brain, figure out what needs to change, what new patterns need to be in place, and then choose to make those changes. So it can't change as long as it remains subconscious. It can only change when it gets to the conscious mind that is the ability to think through possible changes. 
So I need to become aware, and that's why we spend so much time on self-awareness. I need to become aware of what is going on in my subconscious program. Bring it to the conscious, and then I can change it. But that leads to another problem. So way back, I told the story of the challenge of complex trauma and the subconscious program by telling the story of riding a bicycle. So what happens in riding a bicycle? You know that if you turn the handlebars to the right, you go right. And so you practice that as a child. You do it hundreds and hundreds of times, and pretty soon it becomes part of a subconscious program. You get on a bike, and you don't even think about it. You can be talking to a friend, looking around, and you're just steering it subconscious programming. So what they decided to do was change a certain bike so that if you turned the handlebars to the right, you actually went to the left. So you know conceptually, oh, okay, I get that. I just do the opposite. But what happened was people got on a bike and as long as they were fully concentrating on, I want to turn left, that means I got to turn right, then they could do the right thing. But as soon as somebody said, hey, you, and distracted their conscious brain, they went back to their subconscious brain, and they steered the old way, and they crashed the bike. And so they began to realize that to get reprogramming of the subconscious to the new way took up to a year of conscious, concerted effort. And so it would be, you concentrate, you ride your bike, and then you get distracted and you go back to the old autopilot and you crash. And then you learn again, you try again, you do again, and you go back from your conscious brain to your subconscious brain. And you keep working and working consciously until your subconscious is reprogrammed. And that is the challenge of complex trauma. You are spending concerted concentration on developing new habits, new patterns, reprogramming your subconscious brain. But the minute you're not concentrating about it, you go back to the old autopilot, to the old patterns. And so you're back and forth between your conscious and subconscious until you can get to the point where you can reprogram that subconscious. So it takes a lot of time to heal trauma. It is not an instant fix. So again, I don't say that to discourage you, but to give you a realistic picture of what this is all about. But I want to add that for people who have done it, yes, it's hard work. Yes, it's frustrating at times. Yes, you think you're never going to be done at times, but it is worth it. And they're glad that they did it. So let's just end by talking about some practical things you can do for healing instant gratification focus. Number one, understand that the most beautiful things in life don't happen instantly. So look at a professional athlete who has this amazing skill and ability. He only has that because of years of practice. Look at a musician, an artist, years of disciplined practice. So anybody with a great skill didn't just instantly do it. Look at the process of training your child to become an adult who becomes your friend. That was years of building into their life, years of hard work, but the reward was worth it. Look at an intimate relationship. It takes years of work, working through differences, conflict, problems, hurts. But if you work at it, after the years of doing it, you're glad you did because the intimacy is worth it. So instant gratification doesn't produce the things that really give true happiness. Understand, secondly that true happiness isn't really about instant pleasure. We've done a whole talk on the ingredients of true happiness, and it's nothing about 
instant pleasure. It's about meeting your 12 needs in a healthy way. So you can look at that talk if you want. Thirdly, develop the habit of thinking through the long-term consequences of decisions. So when you're about to go and buy something or do something, think not just instant gratification, think through the long term. And you have to train yourself to do that and it will take time. Practice waiting occasionally. One of the things I'm so glad I've done in my own life is I'll want something, I might say, yes, I need to get this. And part of me wants to get it now, but I say, no, I'm going to just wait for a week. And I'll see if the desire is still as strong. I'll see if I still need it, but I'm going to just wait. And that has been an important growing up thing in my own life. Not giving in to instant gratification is about good internal boundaries, saying no to yourself. But those kind of internal boundaries are some of the hardest ones to enforce because instant gratification appeals to my limbic brain. And so in, uh, internal boundaries come out of my cortex. And so when I am triggered that I want this now, I switch into my limbic brain, which makes it easy to just override my internal boundaries. So I need to get into my cortex again and play the tape out. But that is difficult. So what I want you to understand is you're not going to do that overnight. You're going to gradually grow in becoming better at enforcing the internal boundaries of your life. So don't beat yourself up if you don't do it perfectly the first time. What might help you in doing this is having some accountability with somebody so that you don't just instantly gratify yourself. You talk to somebody first and say, here's what I'm feeling, and you have some accountability. Next, part of the reason for instant gratification was because you couldn't resolve painful emotions. That was the only way to get out of those painful emotions. So begin learning healthy tools for resolving the painful emotions of your life is an important step. Next, be mindful. And what I mean by that is when you feel the impulse or urge to go to instant gratification, stop and be curious. Say, why am I wanting instant gratification right now? What's going on? Is, are there needs that are unmet? Are there painful emotions I haven't resolved? Is my stress at a certain point where my brain is looking for an escape. Begin mindfulness in, that, in this area. Some people have found that fasting periodically helps them with the instant gratification stuff. And it could be fasting from food, not eating for a day or half a day, or it could be fasting from social media, from being on your computer, from shopping, Whatever you would need to fast from. Some fast from TV for a bit. Or certain pleasurable things they enjoy. Just to train themselves in saying no to some of their desires. And then set some long-term goals. Instant gratification happens when you're only thinking about now. Think of long term. Where do I want to be in five years? What do I need to build into my life if I'm to be there in five years? What kind of things do I have to say no to if I'm going to be there in five years? Think through your life long term. So I hope this has been helpful for you. I hope this just helps you realize that there needs to be a shift in mindset if you're going to do well in recovery from instant gratification to hard work, patience, perseverance, stuff that is very unfamiliar to an instant gratification focus, but stuff that pays off in the long run. So that's the end of part one. We're going to take a short break and I'll come back and give a Christian component 
If you're not interested in that, not a problem. We're not offended. Just glad you've been here for the first part. And we'll see you next week. For everybody else, I'll be back in just a moment. Well, welcome back. We're looking at the life of Peter, and what I thought I'd do today is just touch a wee little bit on Peter, but really kind of develop this instant gratification focus concept in light of the whole Bible and characters in the Bible. And basically what I'm going to say is this. You will find that in following God, serving God, there will be times of instant gratification, of immediate reward, reward, pleasure, but you will also find that much of following God and serving God does not have an instant gratification focus. God often calls us to wait. God often calls us to give and give with few results. God calls us to make sacrifices that we don't seem to get anything back from. And so I want to just give you kind of an overview of the Bible in light of that and then end with Peter. So think with me of Moses, who is the great leader of Israel. He brought them out of slavery in Egypt, led them for 40 years across the desert to the land that God had promised. And so what happened is Moses felt God's call when he was 40 years old. He was going to deliver his people. And then his first attempt fell apart and he had to run into the desert for his life because he was now among Egypt's most wanted. For 40 years, from 40 to 80, he took care of sheep. And I think he said, God, what about your call on my life? I'm wasting my life taking care of sheep. Will your people still die in, the, in slavery? It seems so foolish, like a waste of a life. And then at age 80, when he finally did deliver Israel from Egypt, the next 40 years of his life was, went like this. It started with all of Israel, over 2 million people, excited in following God, devoted to God, But as the 40 years progressed, people turned against God. People turned against Moses. People grumbled. People were obstinate. People rebelled. It was a frustrating 40 years, nothing but headaches for Moses. And when he gets to the the end of the 40 years, when they're at the edge of the land God promised, two people are left are following God. And you go, wow, all of that sacrifice, all of that hard work, So few results. And that's what it felt like for Moses. And then if you go to David, God anointed him as a young boy, 16, to be the next king of Israel. And then what happened is David had to run for his life because King Saul felt threatened by him and wanted to kill him. And he spent the next 14 years running for his life, hiding in the desert. And I'm sure David must have at times said, what's going on here, God? You're wasting the best years of my life, the years when I have the greatest drive and energy and ability to produce. And here I'm in, a, in the desert, hiding in a cave. What is the point? It seems like a waste of time, all this waiting, waiting, And then Jeremiah, he preached to Israel as they were declining as a nation. And he preached to them for 50 years saying, 
you need to turn back to God. If you don't, you're, start, you're going to start experiencing some very painful consequences. You'll get taken into captivity by a foreign nation. Jeremiah's message was not well received. He was persecuted. He was, all kinds of bad things happened to him. But he kept preaching faithfully, faithfully for 50 years. He went with Israel into captivity. He watched horrific things happen as Israel was taken into captivity. The abuse, the torture, the raping of women, the killing of children, the the famine that took place, his heart broke, and at the end of it all, hardly anybody followed God. Fifty years of sacrifice, hardship, faithfulness, and hardly a result to point to at all that would prove success in his ministry. And then go to the life of Jesus. He took this public ministry that lasted for just over three years. He took 12 men. He went around Israel and preached and healed. And at first there was wonderful results, thousands of people wanting to follow him. But then the tide turned against him from the religious leaders and then the people began to turn against him and they eventually crucified him. And when he was crucified, we find that even his 12 followers ran away. They were quite weak and vulnerable. And there was only over a hundred people who still faithfully followed him. A lot of sacrifice, a lot of hard work, very few visible results. And then we go to the next great person, Paul, who was the, the missionary that went into the world beyond the Jewish nation into the Gentile world. And he, he took the message of Jesus into modern-day Europe and Turkey. And he started many, many churches, and many people came to follow Jesus because of his life and ministry. But when you get to the end of his life, you find that pretty well all the churches that he had started were small and were struggling, Many people had walked away from it. It was a very discouraging, depressing thing. Paul was eventually martyred. It seems like, wow, what's the point of all that hard work? And then we come to Peter. He starts this church in Jerusalem and thousands become followers of Jesus every day. And it's exploding and it's wonderful and exciting But then persecution starts to happen from the religious leaders, but then from Rome. And what we find is that people were being killed for being a follower of Jesus. And people fled all over the world to escape this persecution. And as Peter comes to the end of his life, he is martyred too. But the churches that he started are small. There's just not a lot of encouraging signs. So what I want you to see is that following God for all of those key figures of our heritage, following God looked like it was a disaster. What's the point? They made countless sacrifices beyond what any of us have ever experienced. Persecution, torture, death with such few apparent positive results. So there's two things that I want you to understand about God's world. Number one is we often don't see the results of our labor in our lifetime. Moses and David, Jeremiah, Paul, they died thinking their lives hadn't amounted to much, but we still benefit from it today. They couldn't see thousands of years into the future to see the impact of their lives on future generations, but it was there. Secondly, in God's world, this world is only a part of it, a small part of it. There's still an eternity. And what God says about his world is that this time in this world 
will be full of some hardship, disappointment, lack of results. But your reward isn't fully given in this world. Your reward is given fully in the next world. And so we wait for that. We labor, we sacrifice, we deny ourselves. We don't necessarily get instant gratification, but we know that it's coming. We know that God will fully reward those who are faithful to him. And so I hope that again just shows you that God's world is really, really big on delayed gratification. Instant gratification is not seen as an important part of being a healthy person and a healthy follower of Jesus. Let's pray. Father, just encourage us to be faithful, to persevere for those who are struggling with discouragement, with disappointment, that you would just encourage them and just help them to realize that in your world, things operate a little bit differently, but it's worth it in the end. Amen. Well, thank you again for being part of this Friday night with us. I hope